this is David for Big Bits, and in this video we're going to talk about our sixth scripting tutorial, and that is for forecasting. Now, if you're curious what forecasting is, just look at the chart. We have our moving averages that we've been working on, but we also have some dots off to the side, and those dots are actually forecasted values for where the moving average is going to be. Now, we've done a lot of work in uh, this particular script from the last one, so there's a lot to cover. Some of it is you know, intermediate level programming stuff that uh, isn't going to be super easy, but I'm covering the source code for you, and the source code is completely open on trading view, so even if you don't fully understand it, you'll have access to it and can play around with it to manipulate it however you want. So, let's go ahead and get started. There's a couple of small things I wanted to cover really quick before we get into the meat of the video, and that is we have added some minimum values to our moving average periods and we've also added a step size. Now what the step is is just the increment between points in the setting and for example the MA1 when we tick this up it goes up by one and that's the step size and it also goes down by one every time you tick it. Now for example if you set the step size to something else let's say 0.25 in this setting down here you can see that it goes down by 0.25 and it goes up by 0.25. That's what the step size is. That's really all it takes care of. Now, there was one other thing, and that is the plots for our moving averages. We forgot to give them a title, so I've given them a title, and now when you go to edit, you can see that our plots actually have a title for MA1, MA2, and MA3, so when you edit the styles for the moving averages, you'll know which one you're editing it for. Now, let's get on to forecasting. Now, what is forecasting? Uh, it's pretty difficult uh, concept for some people, but honestly, it's not that difficult. All we're doing is just removing the oldest candles out of a moving average calculation and replacing them with a new candle of the current price. Now, there are ways we can change that, but for now, we're going to cover some basic forecasting, which is, let's say we wanted to go 20 candles back, and this is the 20th candle, and we want to forecast one candle ahead. So what we have to do is we have to remove this candle from our calculation, and then we have to work with the 19 candles, get the moving average of those 19 candles, and then we have to get the price now, and then we have to weight this moving average from those 19 candles 19 times, and then we have our individually weighted current price as a new candle, as the future forecasted candle, and then we get our moving average with the weighted value of the moving average. I know this is starting to sound a little complex. We have our 19 candle average from where we remove the oldest candle, and we have the current price, and we weight those two together in a simple moving average of just two items, in this case, and we get our forecasted value. Now, when you're forecasting two or three candles ahead, you're moving the uh, two oldest candles, or the three oldest, or however many candles you're forecasting ahead, you take those off of the back of your look back period, and then you just weight the current price in that many times. So if you removed two candles, you would weight in the current price twice versus the 18 candle moving average. Yes, I know it's very confusing, and I know I've said it's confusing. Uh, it's not a simple topic for a lot of people, but if you're following along this far, you probably have a pretty good idea of what I'm saying, so I hope you understand. Now, how are we going to make this work with our old version of code? Because uh, what we were doing was we would calculate the moving averages based on an if, uh, an if statement. What type of moving average were we using? and then it would spit out and assign that, that particular moving average a value. Well, what we had to do is we had to create a function to where we could pass in the data that we wanted, and it would spit out the moving average value based on that variable data. Now, if you're a programmer, you're probably familiar with functions, and that's what we're doing. We're replacing those if statements that we repeated several times, with a function. Now, the function in this case, I called it MA, and what it does is it does that one if statement, but it uses that variable data 
to spit out one value. That way we can assign those moving averages to the result of this function. Now this works similar to our if statements. Whatever the last line was uh, that resulted in a value in your function will be the value of the moving average. So if you wanted to assign MA1 to a, to a particular call of this function, you would say MA1 equals and then you would plug in your MA information in this function. It would be MA1 equals MA parentheses MA1 type comma MA1 source comma MA1 period close parentheses and that's all you would have to do. Now the reason we had to do this and we've already discussed these calculations the reason we had to do this was because of the forecasting. Now it, it's also cleaner code too but for the forecasting we had to change the period fairly often because we were removing the oldest candles from these calculations. This is how we did that. We used the period and we subtracted the forecasted amount ahead. Now, ideally, this would be done with the for loop and we wouldn't have to do this over and over and we would only have maybe four or five lines of code total as opposed to 10. Now, that's just a limitation with PineScript is that it wouldn't let me plot within the loop. I think that's probably just protection on their end or something to keep you from plotting too much on a single chart if you had an error in your logic. Now, what I would have done in another language is I would have made a for loop uh, with a variable starting at one and I would have incremented it up and done this calculation but replaced the number one or whatever the number was here, our forecasted amount ahead with that variable. So if you're more familiar with programming, that's probably a better way to do it and if they change uh, PineScript in the future to allow those sort of actions, then I'll go back and I'll change it. Or uh, maybe you know and you've, you're have you aware of a way to do that now, let me know and I'll change it now. I'd appreciate that. But what we're doing is we're setting our forecasted value here to that 19 period look back when we're talking about a 20 period moving average if uh, the MA1 was 20 period now we're subtracting one from it and that essentially removes the last candle the oldest candle from that moving average then we have to weight this one moving average value with that uh, with that period minus our forecast value that weights it and then we have to add in our current price or our current source I should say uh, and multiply that by the weight of our forecast. So if we're looking two candles ahead here, the, uh, the value would be the price times two. Now here it's actually taking this and it's multiplying it by what 19 if we're doing a 19 period look back. So it gets the moving average and multiplies it by 19, some really big number. And then we add on that one into it. So now we essentially have the sum or cumulative value of what our period would be and we could divide that by the number in our period and we can calculate what our forecasted value is. Now this works pretty well. Let's look at the chart. This is a weekly chart on Bitcoin and you can see that uh, it forecasts the price to continue moving up if price stays the same on the 50 week but you can see the 100 week is actually trending down even if the price were to stay flat here. Now before I get too far ahead you can already see that it looks like it might predict an intersection in the future which might be a signal that you should buy or sell depending on what the market says. But let's go ahead and look at these functions real quick. I have this documented in the code. This is just some documentation that shows you how the functions work, how multi-line functions work, etc. There's plenty of information here you can actually plot a value that ca that is calculated from a function in the plot line. So there's plenty you can do. Uh, I definitely recommend you check out the documentation if you're going to work with it for yourself with something else. Uh, but for what we've done here, there's probably plenty uh, for your moving averages you can figure out. Now, that was actually quite a lot. And you can see this is the MA1 forecast here. And I had to repeat that code for the MA2 and the MA3. Now, like I said, ideally we would have loops that would take care of this for us, but 
uh, it's okay. We can repeat this code over and over. It would have been very simple. Uh, there's not a whole lot of extra code this way since we only have five forecasted values. If we had 20, then the three or four lines of code that a loop would have used would have saved us a lot. But since we only have four or five, it's not a huge deal right now, honestly. Now, what is a bias? And with the indicator that I'm working at, what we're going to be talking about is a bullish, bearish, or neutral bias. And neutral is the probably the most common way to do a forecast uh, for most people when they're thinking about it is you just take the current price and you move it out. Now other ways I've seen to do it is to use the slope of the moving average and kind of print that on out further and use the uh, calculated value based on the slope of the moving average in the future as that value to see where the moving average would be. I'm not really sure why that would be a better way than any other way. So what I've done is I've actually created a way to where you can manage the bias in a bullish or a bearish factor so that you can see the potential impacts on the forecasting. So let's pull this up and I'll show you. Let's go back to our inputs and we have bias here. This is a neutral bias right now. So this is as if the price were to stay flat for the next five candles. You can see the forecast go slightly down here, slightly up here. Let's try changing it to a bullish bias. Ah, you can see they both kind of moved up. The 100 still kind of moves down. Uh, it looks like it might even go up first and then move down. And then the 50 just kind of continues to move up a little bit more rapid pace. Now, what's happening is instead of using the price for the next five candles or calculating the slope of this line and pushing it out five candles and calculating where it would be, what we're doing is we're actually getting the average true range. There's kind of a measure of volatility for the candles in the past. We're getting the average true range of a 14 period look back and we're applying that forecast in a bullish or bearish way to calculate where the price would go. Because honestly, if you look back at Bitcoin's history, or pretty much anything, the price doesn't stay, stay flat for very long. There's usually some sort of volatility, and if there is volatility, it's usually bullish or bearish. Now, it's not always bullish, and it's not always bearish. So to handle that, i done something called... Uh, what I call a magnitude and essentially with a magnitude of one it takes the average true range of the last 14 candles and predicts the price to move up each candle by that average true range amount. Now if it were bearish it would move down by that average true range amount by one if the magnitude was one. Now essentially all the magnitude does is it multiplies this average true range by a certain number so that you can manipulate how big of an effect you think is going to happen so for example while price was consolidating here and you knew there was going to be a big breakout and you thought it was going to be bearish you could have set your bias to bearish and changed your magnitude much higher and you can see the effect this is having on the forecast the higher the magnitude the more it's pushing it down so if you think uh, the price is going to go down like quite substantially, <laughs> then you can see the effect this would have on the moving averages. Now, I wouldn't recommend a number that high, most likely, but uh, it might be a good idea to use 0.5 here because essentially this is a bullish direction and it's a good way to account for some of the candles being red because if you just multiply it by one you're you're essentially saying the average true range 14 times in a row and that's not really realistic uh, if you were to do that candle by candle but it, it is a way for you to be able to manipulate it now how do we do this I've already kind of mentioned an average true range and multiplying that and really that's all it is so let's go through and look at how we calculate the bias now the bias is used for all of the different forecasts because it is predicting essentially the next candle, where that price is going to be from where we were. Now, how do we do that? We made a function for bias to calculate the bias. Now, if your, uh, your forecast bias is neutral, it returns zero. Okay, we're not going to add anything additional to the candle. 
So what's happening is it's actually using the base price here and it's adding on top of that the average true range. But since we're neutral here, we're not adding anything on top of it. Now if it were bullish, as I mentioned, it would use the average true range of the bias period, which is 14 by default, which is a pretty standard average true range. And then you multiply that by your magnitude. So your next candle predicted out, the price would be based on the average true range on top of the current price. Okay, so it would add that average true range up and this is what it would expect for the next price and it would continue doing that for each candle. Now, if you were to do a bearish bias, you'll see that it does the exact same thing as the bullish except it multiplies it by negative one. So it'll take your current price and it will add a negative number which just subtracts it to where it'll think your forecasted price is going to be based on this value on this candle, which is lower. So hopefully this all makes sense. And what we do in order to uh, accommodate that for each length of the forecast is we just add that on there as many times as we're forecasting out. And this calculation works pretty well. So you can find this script on my profile. And this is the sixth one. And by the time you look at this, there's probably going to be more. I've already started working on a seventh, which has uh, some new stuff in it. We'll talk about in the next video. But uh, you can get this and you can look at the source for yourself and play around with it. But more importantly, if you're interested in seeing where something might cross over based on these changes, you can play around with the settings yourself. Change the magnitude. Change the uh, the bias period for the ATR. Change whether it's bullish, bearish, or neutral. You know, there's plenty of things you can do to impact the forecasting here to get it to work to how you think the market is going to move. Like I said, if you think it's going to be bearish, set it to bearish. If you think it's going to be really bearish, change the magnitude to a higher number. And you can see the impacts all this is going to have on it, which I think is pretty cool. I haven't seen this on an indicator before. And I guarantee you, in the next video, we're going to be doing something really neat, uh, and that is changing the resolution for each of these moving averages. So you could be looking at a weekly chart, or let's say, for example, we're looking at the daily chart. We can, we can plot the weekly moving average on the daily chart so that you can see where a weekly moving average, such as the 200 here, which proved support back here, you could see this on a daily chart and maybe that's helpful for spotting support or resistance when you're looking in at uh, much lower time frames, much lower resolution. So thank you for watching. That is the video for today. Please hit like if you like the video. I know there was a lot to cover and there's a lot more going on. And uh, please subscribe if you like this series. We're doing all kinds of videos uh, about trading and automation, indicators, things like that. We're doing all kinds of stuff. And if you got any ideas, please let me know. I, I love to look into doing the ideas that people submit. Uh, we're going to be working on a lot of projects related to cryptocurrency and such on this channel. So please, please subscribe. Uh, that's all for today. And I look forward to you watching the next one.